greeting everyone and welcome to the BDs and it's just another day at the office for us. Today is the 8th of December and we're going to talk about selecting hair. We're going to work on the wolf bodies, finish those up and we have some questions from um, our previous presentation to, to answer. But anyway, we're the BDs from Boise, Idaho. Gretchen's already at work if you want to poke your head around the corner and say hi. Hi. Yep. <laughs> She's already cranking her flies. And one of the things that I've done today is I have filled my stackers so that, um, well, in fact, I'll show you. Let me uh, go over to the materials thing. And while we're here, I just want you to notice something. This is a mule deer. This is whitetail deer. We'll talk about that later. But for now, I'm just going to move this camera so you can see what we're talking about. And there's my stackers right there, lined up in a row, uh, wings in one and tails in the other. But let's just go back to where we where we were before. We'll be talking about hair and selection and stuff as we move along. But but for now, let's go to our side by side. Oh, you already got that guy well along. Well, this is well. I'm, I've got two. I'm putting two hackles on this time. Oh, good. And the reason mm. is because this one is a little bit uh, closer to a ginger, so I put one with uh, a little darker. And so when I mix the two, I get more of a medium brown instead mm -hmm. of a ginger. Now talk about mixing the hackle because it's something people don't even think about. They say put brown on well. You want your flies to all be consistent, and you probably are as good as anybody at selecting hackle and getting it to match consistently mixing colors. Yeah, so what I do then is I take the, I'm taking the lighter one and just taking loose wraps forward. And I'll probably just take about one, maybe two wraps in the front and tie that off quite a ways back from the eye, <clears throat> trim it. Then I'm going to take my darker one and I just work it through. If you kind of zigzag it like this, you can kind of work it through. As you can see, I don't know if you can tell in the camera, but that's kind of starting to show a little darker now. Now I'm going to go in front. There was a question about why I don't stick my get my finger stuck when I'm dressing back like this. And it's because instead of going pinching my fingers, let's see, like this, I do it like this and pull back. So that's that's the way I'm doing that. I'm using more than two fingers. So between my thumb and my middle finger, these two, uh, these two fingers, I put on the sides and then the index finger kind of goes on top and that's how i avoid the hook point and i'm just going to take two wraps over the top of that hackle now i'm going to pull back again and push that butt in back into the hackle trim it off and now we're ready to do one of al's good whip finishes which means i start my rotation furthest back from the eye and move forward i hope that helps a little bit with that one question before we leave today, remind me to talk about those good whip finishes because the folks watch, watching it, especially on YouTube, may not have seen that, it, even though it's listed there. And um, the reason I'm such an expert at good whip finishes is because I did a bad one for 40 years before I knew I was doing bad ones. So. <clears throat> anyway, I'm tying my wings on. This is the last one in my dozen, first dozen of 12s. Oh, okay, good. And um, Gretchen told me that I was getting my wings a little long. 
on some of the ones that I gave her before. And of course she corrected for it. So I'm now using a, hackle, um, a, a spare hook to be, make sure that I'm not getting the wings too long. I want you to notice here, I'm getting ready to trim off the waist. Trimming is really important. I didn't cover that as well as I should have based on some of the questions uh, in our last presentation. And if you just reach in like this and go clunk to cut it off, you're gonna have a big lump there that makes it really difficult to have a smooth body. And a smooth outer body starts with a smooth underbody. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna come from the off side of the vise. Notice that I'm pulling the, the hair up at about a 45 degree angle. Lay the scissors in flat along the shank and cut. And that creates a very severe angle that blends the wing and tail hairs together quite well. Now I'll wrap forward. I'm going to have to stand these wings up. And I'll just wrap a, a thread dam in front. Kind of kind of get them tilted up, but I actually anchor the each wing post in an upward position. See, that's sort of up, but you can see they're tilted forward. <clears throat> And I'm just going to pull this down to the side. Hopefully you can see that. And I'm just getting my wings divided. And then I'm just going to cross through them one time, just like that. And I'm going to take the off wing now and go around it a couple of times. Loose but not real tight wraps the third turn. Now I'm going to grab that wing and hold it and really, really tighten up on that thread. And that sets that wing right there. You can see how, how taut that wing, wing is right there, straight up. A couple of turns around the hook. Now I'm going to go to the near side wing. Three snug but not tight turns. And now I'm going to have to go backwards around the hook, crossing over, pulling backwards, and setting that hook in place. A couple of turns around, crisscross between. And now I'm going to finish the the fly. We'll talk about it right now, but I just completed what's called a, what we call a good whip finish. So what's a good whip finish? It's one that starts back on the hook and travels forward. And for years, I used to do a whip finish. I, I'd reach the, the, the front of the, the, of the hook. My thread would be hanging at the hook eye. I'd grab my whip finish tool and just throw a whip finish on. Each subsequent turn would go back on the hook a little bit. Well, that, that causes a problem in that the strand of thread you're trying to hide under the wrapped thread lays across them before it goes under. I'll show you in a little after a bit. Let me get some of these, some of these uh, flies uh, out of the way here. Yeah, I'm needing some more. You're running out of... Uh, yeah, I've got all this dozen done, so I need a few more. Okay. I got another dozen here waiting for you. Okay. Let me, uh, I'll put, let me put the thread on the hook and I'll grab them for you. I'll put these in the box. Yeah, all see. right. Getting to the end of the shank back. halfway back forward. And I'm going to stop right here and grab some hooks or some bodies that I've already got done to give to Gretchen so that she can uh, continue on with this uh, with this order. I should have set them over there before we started the day and I didn't get around to it. But anyway, uh, in case you're interested, there's a dozen bodies. Anyway, here you go, Gretchen, you got them? Okay, good. I don't think I dropped any in the trash. If I did, tell me my count's off and we'll have to find it. Well, three. All right. One of the things we're not six. doing that we did last time is that we were selecting the, the deer hair and cutting it out and showing you all, of, all about doing that. Well, no, it's already been done. And yesterday we had to, we were on hold uh, talking uh, to an organization. And so I spent some time filling stackers while we were wasting our time listening to music on hold. Made a kept productive even though I was on hold 
on the on the telephone. All right, there we go. I'll trim that off. Wrap forward, and I'm really putting some tight, tight wraps right here in the middle. This area right here is what we have call anchor wraps. And as we wrap towards the bend, they're not loose, but they're snug, not not real tight, so that the the tail doesn't flare out. But I think of it, I'll show you on the next on the next tail just to, what we mean by that. Okay. All right, we're gonna tie on this wing. Having the wings kind of prepared makes it go a lot faster. However, you do have to take time to, to prepare the hair and so forth, but I was wasting my time on hold anyway. So there's several turns snug, but not real tight. Now I'll, I'll, I'll move my gauge in place and uh, a little bit long. I better pull that in just a little bit. I pull it into, so it's equal to the shank and length. And then I'll just put tight turns on and that rolls the hair from the side of the hook right up on top. Now I'll uh, lay my scissors flat along the shank from the offside and do a trim that is a really tight trim there. Another way you can stand hair up, uh, especially if you're doing something like a comparadon, is you can stand it up a little bit at a time. You take a, a few fibers and run your thread through and see how that one bundle kind of sticks up a little bit? Well, that's being held in place by that strand that I put in there. I'll divide the re remaining bundle of hair and stand some more up. Usually takes about four four applications on a size 12 to get it stood up. And then the last one, we just wrap the thread dam in front. <clears throat> this particular maneuver works a lot better on animal hair or on deer hair than it does on calf tail. Calf tail tends to be a little, um, a, a little harder to manage because it's so dense. Okay, but I want you to notice that the wing is, except for a couple of wild fibers, is standing up pretty good. Well, anyway, I'm going to get my thread positioned behind the wings and then pull them off to the side here so I can get a, di a division on the, on the fibers. And just like before, around the bundle on the far side, we call this posting the wings. And they post quite a bit different when you have the through the bundle technique that I showed you just now, than when we just make them stand up by wrapping around them. So I have to be a little bit more careful. I ended up crowding the hook eye a little bit on that and Gretchen will tell me about it when she gets to it. There we go. Yeah. Get another hook out here. I kind of take a look at his, the fly when I put it in. Some of them I'm going to have more room here in the front. So when I've got a whole bunch of room here in the front, then I won't, I'll only leave just enough for a couple of turns back here. If this is shorter, then I leave more room here for. That's for how you turns. compensate for me screwing up on the wings, right? <laughs> yeah. And really, once you get the fly done, yeah, you can't. Uh, I mean, we're talking the difference between a turn here and a turn there. And you just have to be prepared to know where you're going and where to stop. And I'd like you to speak a little bit about mixing hackle. I know you did just a bit ago, but. As an example, a grizzly brown mix is not always an even grizzly brown mix to get a consistent look to a box of flies that goes to a fly shop where you've got 30 dozen flies in a box. And how do you keep all the hackles looking the same? Well, this is a, okay, for example, this has got some pretty good color to it. It's got a, a black around the uh, stem. So I'm going to put that, oops, I got to do my, you got me off, off my game here. I got to put on my peacock first. Okay. Sorry. It wouldn't, it wouldn't work real good to have the hackle on the back. Let me get this peacock on and then I'll do those hackles. 
<clears throat> One of the things when I do this first hack, I'll have to be careful not to mess up his tail. If I go too far back and too tight, I can make that tail flare. So I'm careful about not messing with the tail. And today I'm using um, the stretchy nylon instead of just the, the th thread to put on the... Yeah, it's called Nylon Flex by Danville or UniFlex by, by the Uni Company. And the reason I'm doing that is because this is a size 12, so I can use a, a larger gauge material without making it too bulky. In fact, the stretch nylon or the nylon stretch and the Uniflex uh, is a product you can thank us for because in the early 90s, we ran across that in a Bernina sewing store. Came in thousand yard rolls. I think it's thousand yard rolls. Anyway, Something like one that. big doggone spool. And um, we found that and just loved it. We brought it home. Yeah, but it was in the wrong colors. It was in sewing store colors, you know. But we found that some of the lighter colors, like the white and so forth, we could put it on the hook and then touch it with a felt tip marker and recolor our flies on the river. Well, that was a great idea, but we really wanted to be able to incorporate the product into our commercial tying. So we contacted Danville and asked them to consider supplying it. And we contacted Danville and asked them to supply it. And we, and we kept contacting them. And after five years, they finally said, well, we'll give it a try. And well, then since about 95, it's been one of the, on, in their product line, dyed to their colors. And, uh, but it took a little bit of persistence. And okay, I'm to, ready to do this hackle. Okay, you go right ahead. I've been I'll waiting just, for you to finish that. Yeah, you go right This ahead. is a, a, a fairly light, almost a ginger brown here. <laughs> I'm going to use it, and then I was showing you earlier the starker one. So I'm going to mix these two so I get closer to a medium. And, and remember, you leave enough space so you've got some bare stem on the first maybe half turn of hackle that you do. So I'll tie these on. Got all that. A little too much bare stem there. I'll turn off, uh, trim off the excess. I'm going to leave my my thread hanging about halfway between the wing and the eye, and I'm going to start with this lighter colored one. And so I don't do super tight turns. I leave a little space there to come back with the darker one couple of turns in front. And then notice I'm tying this off about halfway between the eye and the wing. And I'm going to trim it. Not too worried about holding that because I'm going to be wrapping the other hackle over it. So I, I don't do a whip finish or a half hitch or anything. So now I'm going to come back with my dark hackle. And I just wiggle it through. If you notice my hackle when I'm holding it, I don't know if you can see that, but I almost have a turn in it because I'm keeping it constantly turned so that the darker color faces out. Okay, now I'm going to come forward. Oop. I'm going to have to hold that hackle back there. There we go. Take about three turns. Take two wraps over the top of it. I'm going to pull it back. Wrap back over the top of that butt end there. Push it back into the hackle. I'm having a little trouble with this one. It's being cranky. Not everything is always smooth. Now pull it forward and trim it off. Now I'm going to do my good whip finish. Oop. 
I like to use a whip finish tool, particularly on these, because I can be more exact where I'm placing my threads. It makes a little neater head. I don't know on a 12 how much it matters, but there you go, completed fly. One of the things that's interesting, especially when you're doing hackles that are a grizzly brown mix, that um, that's not always an even division of colors on a grizzly brown mix. You have to evaluate the amount of color in the grizzly, and you know you've got light grizzlies and dark grizzlies, and then you're mixing it with various colors of brown that aren't always consistently the same color. And what you want to do, though, is come up with it, what looks like it's an even grizzly brown mix. Sometimes it's a 70-30 mix, and sometimes it's a 50-50. It's it just depends on how, what the colors are. 70% being what? 70% being grizzly and 30% being brown. If you happen to have a really light grizzly and a really dark brown, and it, it's an evaluation process for on every fly to that you end up with a box of a lot of flies going to a fly shop or to a customer that look like that all look the same. And one of the things we strive for as commercial tires is consistency from from fly to fly in a box and from year to year when we are servicing customers over an extended period of time. Some customers like heavier hackle than others. So you kind of know your customer, what they like. Yeah, we, we keep um, sheets on the customers that we know that XYZ Fly Shop in Bozeman wants their hackle a certain way and um, and the tails a certain way. And anyway, we just keep kind of a, a log on everything. And people ask us, uh, well, have you tried this new material? Oh, no, and not unless the customer has asked for it because the customer isn't looking for something different. They're looking for something that, again, they want to provide to their customer that's been coming to their fly shop for year after year. Um, consistency that they can expect to, to come to Bozeman, Montana or wherever and buy a fly that's going to look like the flies they got several and years it's ago. Not, it's not just the customer. It's also the guides that work for that shop. Absolutely. I think it's very particular about color. I'm going to have to get some more hackle. Okay. Uh, let's take a moment and you can show. Did we show last time how we uh, no. did the hackle? Well, you've got your mic off, right? Yeah. Let me switch to the full shot. And uh, we'll go to this shot. So you can bring the box of hackle over and <clears throat> show them. We said in the evening sizing uh, hackle, we'll take a full saddle or a full cape and a, and a gauge and, and that's just a bunch of brown. And let's see, we've got size six up here and size 12 down here. So it's all under. under this kind of stuff that you put between your dishes to keep it from rattling in your camper. Well, it's also great to keep your hackle from getting mixed all over the place. Otherwise, those hackles will sit in there and talk to each other and they'll climb over the fence and get into the one next to them. Now, you think I'm kidding, but it, it, I swear it seems like that's the way it is. But it, of course, I know it's not. But it's just too bad they don't reproduce while they're at it. Yeah, no kidding. It would be really great if they came pre sized. I mean, Whiting Farms does a really great job of providing saddles and, and even capes that are pretty darn close to pre sized, but they haven't got there yet. <clears throat> okay, well, I'm going to go back to the tight shot. You're just pulling the hackle out now. So, yeah. And there we go. <clears throat> All right, there's um, I've got a wild hair here I need to get rid of. Broken tips is something you really want to watch for when you're selecting uh, calf tails if you're able to. to Select them and take a look at what's in the store. Look for the first thing is, is the hair straight, number one? And number two, is there a lot of broken tips or not? If there's broken tips, they're good for the going to the, to the field and fishing type flies, but they're not worth a darn if you're trying to 
tie to impress people for, a, let's say, a fly tying contest as an example, or a customer, or just something to share with your friends. You want you want your you want your flies to look as good as possible. The old adage that well, that's good enough for the fish. That's fine, but the truth of the matter is that's the excuse you use when um, when you didn't quite do like you're supposed to. And hey, I've used it myself as as recent as last week, so it does happen. By the way, I want to show you something on dividing the wings. Last time I would switch my vise around so you could see me dividing the wings like that. Well, in in re in, in reality, we do that so you can see because we're pointing right here at this camera that's, that's right here. And you're looking right, looking at it from your viewpoint. In reality though, all I do is I just kind of divide it by, I want you to notice that I'm pulling them to the side, I'm pulling them apart. Uh, the near side is being pulled forward, the far side is being pulled back. And all I'm doing is looking for an even division. And I don't need to rotate that device to see that. One of the things you might do if you decide to put some chat on either Facebook or on YouTube either, or we look at them all, we just don't have time to look at them and turn out flies for our regular day-to-day -day work. But if you're interested in getting into the side of the business, uh, taxes and all that kind of stuff, one of the realities of the world and being a commercial tire is a thing called federal excise tax. So, and that is just a doggone quagmire it, to say the least. And, uh, but it's, if you're interested in having us talk about it, we sure learned a lot about it over the last 60 years. So, yeah, okay, I'm starting my thread base about the one third position on the hook. We did get a, an IRS audit on our excise tax too one time. Yes. And sure luckily did. we were, we had just attended a class <clears throat> and knew pretty much what we were doing. And when the guy found out who we attended the class with, and he said, okay, we're done. <laughs> now that was, um, we were in, in Delta, Colorado at the time, but the class was um, at the Fly Tackle Dealer Show, which is uh, was a yearly uh, occurrence where the dealers would get together with the suppliers and, and have a show, and then all the fly shops would come getting ready and making their orders for the next year. So the fly factories out of Singapore and Malaysia and South America and Africa and everything had their people there selling flies and taking orders for delivery in the spring to the fly shops. And interesting, when you're dealing with people in Africa and in South America, they have a summer season all the time. It's either where they live or it's where we live. And so they're able to stay pretty busy all the time by working the summer season uh, on, on their fly tying excursions, if you will. Uh, what the heck's going on here? I, don't, I miscounted my my stackers and I, I put an empty stacker in with my other stackers. I wasn't watching what I was doing and all of a sudden my count was off. Anyway, sorry, back to fly factories in in South America and all these other places, they get to work the summer all the time because it's summer somewhere in the world. Okay, we're gonna, I'm coming down towards the end of this dozen. When I get to the dozen, end of the dozen, we're gonna talk about selecting hair because if you got the wrong hair, tying hair wing flies, you are a one frustrated person and you're gonna have a lot of flies that, well, the fish don't care, but, they won't look real good. And it's all a matter, it, it's a matter of skill, of course. But I'll tell you what, the importance of the right material is uh, more, I'd say it's 60% um, material and 40% skill. There we go. Because Gretchen and I are pretty well versed in in tying these flies. And if we got the wrong hair, we can turn out an acceptable fly. I was going to say, perfect. sometimes That's, with their skill, you can use less than perfect material and still come up with a pretty good fly. Yeah, key word mm -hmm. in that last <laughs> sentence was pretty good. Well, yeah. Better than what most people would come up with, but still, it's uh, 
a tail that doesn't want to. Well, and the problem is it takes you a little longer to deal with hair that isn't as good. Yeah, it sure does. It and it's, um, slows down your production. Yep, sure does. And production is kind of a, well, during the heyday when we were tying for shops uh, for our living, uh, it was um, our goal each day was a minimum of 10 dozen flies each per day during the winter when we were doing our tying. And then, of course, in the summer we were guiding and, and the only and the tying that happened was when I'd get on my cell phone when they actually got to be a viable option back in the later 90s and call Gretchen and say, I've been on the river with clients and I used up all of my XYZ pattern, whatever it might be. Let's say it's a, it was a stimulators or it was a Prince Nymphs anyway. And I'm sure going to need some more for tomorrow. And she'd tie flies in the hour that it took me to drive home. And I'd have another batch of flies waiting for me to, to go out to fish with a customer. <clears throat> I just, I don't know if anybody was watching me, but I started to tie that hackle and recognized I didn't have enough hackle left. So I just let it unravel and I tied on another little hackle. Oh, the piece was too short? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I found your uh, hackle gauge. Oh, where was it? What's that? Where was it? It was laying on the floor. Ah. Stuff happens. You know, magically things get get into a new place and you don't see it. I'm still a little short on this hackle, so I'm going to have to get out a hackle plier and, so I can get the last little bit. <clears throat> I don't normally, when I'm tying for production, use hackle pliers unless I get into a pinch, which is where I am now. I just barely have enough to hackle that fly. One of the lucky things about, um, now there's one I missed, but it's not real tight yet. So let me see if I can pull it out. Yep, I could. And what I did there is that I hadn't tightened my thread up yet because I haven't adjusted the length of the of the wing and I saw I had a broken tip in there. Usually you can find those broken tips because uh, the, the hair fibers will be a little bit shorter after you've made your hair selection. And sometimes you can just kind of flick your finger through the bundle of hair and those broken tips will come out. And in other times they don't, they can be a real pain in the neck to get rid of. All right, now we'll come up, stand those up. And divide them. I don't know if you saw what I did there, but my hackle wasn't quite, or my peacock was not laying quite right. It would have gone on like this. I didn't want it facing that way. So I took it and I just pulled it towards the back and then back around. And that made the right part that I wanted facing forward, facing forward. And that's just a little trick that I, you know, you do that you don't even realize you do, but it took me a whole day to of uh, frustration frustration to to learn how to do that. Uh, and then once you you get it, it just becomes automatic. Here's something I was just about to finish this one up, and I noticed that the wings. Uh, you may not see it on camera, but the wings are. I'm going to exaggerate. They're tilted way back too far. And um, we really want them at, at about a 90 degree angle. So what I'm going to do to straighten that out is they need to come forward just a little bit. I'll take one turn around the offside wing. Of course, now I'm going to be wrapping backwards, but I'm going to pull on that. Okay, now that's perfect. I'll make a couple of turns backwards around the hook. Now I'm going to come through the near side wing and pull that forward and take a couple of wraps in the right direction. So I've reversed wrapped and then straightened my wraps back out to reset those wings. 
And even at that, after they bit, these wings are set in a, in a drawer for a while, waiting to be finished by, by Gretchen, sometimes uh, those wings will still have to be reset. And that's how we reset the wings so that they're setting straight up and down. And I'm gonna be off camera for just a minute here, picking up a couple of hair stackers that I knocked over. As I finish up here, I'm, I'm uh, putting my stackers away because typically we don't tie as many large orders like we used to, and and um, we don't uh, have to have a whole bunch of stackers out. There we go. Now let's see. I'm down to three bodies to finish, and then we'll we'll be talking about uh, hair selection, and that that can be pretty <clears throat> pretty critical, as you'll soon find out. Now, one of the things I will narrate to, I'm going to show you here in a minute, and you saw it earlier, briefly, is that we only use white-tailed deer in, in our hair wing flies. We don't use um, mule deer. The reason is, and you'll we'll look at it here in a minute, <coughs> excuse me, the reason is that it's kind of like, let's compare shirts that a guy can wear. It's like a pinstripe shirt with even consistent stripes on the shirt. That's white tail. And you get a um, mule deer and his shirt is like a camouflage shirt with no rhyme or reason to the, to the design on it, if you will. And that's what we run into with the, the difference between the two. Got a broken tip here to get rid of. And so anyway, the reason we don't use the mule deer is because it's really difficult to get a consistent look from one fly to the next fly. And uh, not that they're not wrong. They're wonder, it's wonderful hair for tying flies. It's just if you want to consistently turn out flies that look the same year in and year out, you do a better job when you're using whitetail. Doesn't mean that coastal deer doesn't work fine and a whole lot of other things. I know we'll probably get a hundred answers of well, why don't you use this? We only do it for consistency in appearance. It has nothing to do with quality of material. The reason I have some mule deer here to, as a comparison is for the comparison purposes, of course, but it's also because, you know, for just fishing flies that Gretchen and I are going to go fishing with, it's just fine. In fact, it's beautiful. The tails have a camouflage look to them rather than the consistent dark tips, tan band, and going into the other part of the of the uh, t of the tail or the or the or the hair fiber. I'll show you here in a minute. I only got a couple more to do. Let me measure this wing. Got, got away from me that time and I put too much pressure. One of the things about going around that, that, that wing post, it, it just pulled off. The thread, if you put too much pressure, it just slips off. So what you have to do is hold the wing, pressure on the thread, relax the hand holding the wing and the thread. Move it to there. Now it's not under pressure yet until I grab the wing. Then I put pressure on the thread again, come around, relax both. Till I can move that thread. And now I'll grab the wing and apply pressure and set that wing in place. Same thing on the near side. And then we've got a wild one here. I'll just cut it off. Okay, I'll uh, get my whip finish tool out. See, I've got two things to show when we get done here. The whip finish, a good whip finish and a bad one. And also the selection of hair. 
And by the way, if you really want to get into an in-depth review of hair selection, go through our YouTube channel. And I forget, it, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's the one tying, it says the, the title is Tying Humpies from A to Z. And we go to a very in-depth hair selection process of what part of the animal does it come from? And all of that is really important whether you're tying humpies and the part of the humpy because the, the hump on a humpy is formed out of one hair and the wing and the tail is out of another part of the body. So set that aside, grab a uh, tail. And I got a little bit too much for that tail. Let's talk about proportions in the tail for a minute and the proportions in a wing, but we'll start with the tail. What we have here is a bundle of hair and we've got two ways to identify whether it's the right amount of hair. The one we use, but the most difficult to show is that we'll grab the hair, give it a twist, and then we'll compare that twisted over piece of hair to the outside of the hook eye. If the circumference of the outside of that twisted over hair and the hook eye are similar, it's pretty close to the same. Well, a really quick way to do it is uh, what we call the gather method. It's a little easier to demonstrate on, on camera as well. And that is we just bundle the hair. Notice how my, the left fingers are right here coming in from this way. The right fingers are coming in from the other direction. Bundle, 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 press. Hold it up. And that should be about... 80% um, of the gap of the hook will give you a tail. It's uh, the prop, pro, proper proportions. Bundle, 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 press. And now we'll set it into place. Or you can do like some people I know that uh, aren't trying to turn out dozens of flies per hour uh, or per day rather, not, not per hour. Um, and they'll count, count the fibers in theirs, especially if they're enter, entering a fly tying contest or something similar. <clears throat> okay, there's my... Uh, you know, people often ask how many turns of, of uh, hackle do you put on a fly? Interesting thing is, is that not all feathers are equal. Some of them are th have thicker, more a higher count of barbules per inch of stem or whatever, um, whereas others are are sparser. And so it's more like the look, if that makes any sense. So I can't tell you how many turns I do. I do it till it looks right. It's best yeah, I can. And that's one of the things that experience gives you. And she's dang good at it, let me tell you what. I do well, I have thousands of these things. I should be fairly adept. It wasn't always easy because when we started tying commercial, I hadn't tied that long and uh, using this method anyway. And yeah, you got to understand, she t she's been tying since she was six, seven years old. But her dad was a commercial tire, and he tied on a treadle sewing machine that was converted into a rotating vise. And uh, so that's how she learned to tie. And I'm telling you right now, there is a difference. In fact, a, but, few, a few years ago, we wrote a book called Rotary Tying Techniques. And I was doing the photography for that. It took me the better part of a year to do the chapter on the rotary treadle vice because I couldn't make the dang thing go. <laughs> Just tying with my feet didn't work out so well. Anyway, when we first started tying commercially together, Al was very experienced and I wasn't. So it was kind of kind of difficult. I had a lot of catching up to do. And he kept saying, the more you tie, the better you're going to be. Just keep tying. I missed one of my broken tips, so I'll reach in there with my tweezers and pull it down and cut it off. And then, of course, now you don't see it. And we're down to the last fly in this in this dozen. And uh, we'll uh, then after I finish it, we'll we'll talk about whip finishes and stuff like that.
sometimes your thread will get tangled over the uh, over the arm of the of the bobbin, and sometimes you need to do that because it's it's moving too freely, and other times it just happens to get over there, and you need to straighten it out. And that's what I did there. I want to point there. something out. This um, sometimes the feathers are a smaller size when you get closer to the tip. In other words, the little fibers are shorter. Oh, the Christmas tree type. Well, even even a good saddle it, it will vary a little bit. So if you this was a really good saddle I was using. Well, as you notice the tip of it, I think you can tell it looks a little short. But what I've done is I'm adding another hackle, so it's not just the color. And this hackle's a, a little longer. So as you can see, it's making it all look longer and it looks like it's sized perfectly. Whereas actually there's some fairly short fibers in there and then the longer fibers from this hackle. We'll probably get to it at some point down the road, but when you're tying trude style flies, you save up the really bad feathers that are really small on one end and big on the other end. We call them Christmas tree feathers. And you wait and you can tie those on at the front of the hook. And as you wrap up the hill towards the, the wing, you're actually, we call it climbing the hill. Um, the fibers start getting uh, shorter. shorter as you get closer to the end. So the shorter ones will, but they're covering a, a different distance as you climb the hill. And anyway, long story short, it makes them, makes it come out looking like a consistent, perfect hackle application when actually it wasn't. And you had to use up some of the bad feathers uh, in a position. Everything doesn't always go the way you want it to. If you notice, I'm having to do a little work on this fly. I caught some of the fibers because I was talking. So right in here, they're not sticking out like they're supposed to. So I'll just use my bodkin and, and uh, tease those, those fibers out. Okay, I'm trimming out that last bit. <clears throat> oh, I wanted to show you something. One of the things you, do, you don't want to do is Gretchen was talking about not putting too much pressure here at the back. I want you to notice if you do start to put the pressure, you see how those fibers start to flare up? Well, we don't want to do that. Don't want to screw up this fly. So, but anyway, those are holding wraps there. And the actual anchor wraps that keeps the material on top of the hook is right here in the middle, just like we talked about earlier. And of course, when you're tying down calf tail or calf body hair, it's a denser fiber, won't flare, so you can really bail into it. In fact, if you don't, it'll slip off the hook. All right, there we go. I need some darker. It's darker mm -hmm. when I got it turned out to be a 10. Oh, the hackle was a 10? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes when we size watch the TV. Yeah. Depends on how good the movie was, that sometimes the hackles get sized wrong. Some light ones. I had some really light feathers, so I needed to get a dark one. So if you take a look at this one, it's quite a bit darker than, say, this one. So I'll use those two together and come up with a good mix. I you notice that I've got an O ring on the on my bobbin and that's to keep the thread from becoming unthreaded when it's just laying around i don't know what it is about bobbins and thread but they'll unthread themselves so easy i can't believe it but if you just do that that's that's very helpful by the way that uh, is a tip we published in play tire magazine several years ago came from a good friend who's a commercial tire also in lewiston idaho his name is leroy hyatt Okay, I'm getting ready to, to talk about um, selecting 
hair and all that kind of stuff, Gretch. Is that, do you have anything you wanted to talk about before I do that? Mm, no, you read the questions that people had. Of, if if I we, covered everything I need well, I to. Think we've covered pretty well. You did you did you you talked about pushing the fiber hair tackle fibers back to, yep. to, to wrap the head? Yep. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, she does it a little different than I do. When what we're talking about is you pull the hackle fibers back and then you wrap the, the, the head in there. Well, a lot of people are complaining about hitting the, the point of the hook. Well, she does it positioning her hands so that it won't be lining up with the hook point. And I do it so that my fingers are in a circle and I'm actually using the tips of the finger and this this part of the circle is um, uh, not even close to the hook point. So it, we do it slightly different and it's just the way people are, I guess. Anyway, I've got a hook in the vise there. I'm gonna set that as, leave that there for a moment. While we go over here to, let's see, I probably need to go to full screen on this. There we go, full screen is what, we, what we've got. Let me pull this up just a touch. It seems like it's a little bit out of focus. There we go. Okay, well, one of the things if you're gonna tie with, with hair and you're in the deserty Rocky Mountain West and where Idaho is basically a desert country or count of area, uh, you're gonna need static guard to get rid of static electricity. Now, that's the one we use as a as a reminder to talk to you about static guard, but in reality, this is the one that we use. Comes from the grocery store in the section, uh, in the laundry detergent section of the store, worth, worth having every time. Now here's a couple of pictures we're gonna talk about in selecting the hair. I am going to take them apart. Okay, that's an elk hair, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit, but this is a white-tailed deer hair, deer hide, that uh, it was on uh, one of the sites that we buy hair from uh, on the internet. We usually buy full hides. <clears throat> I want you to notice the difference in the color down the backbone, over the rump area, the shoulders down into here, over the rump, etc. There's a strip probably about six, eight inches wide, all the way down there that's very dark. That's where this came from. Came off of that part of the animal. And I want you to notice that the fibers are very dark. They have dark tips, a tan band, followed by um, a darker area that then fades into light gray. The dark area is dense, doesn't flare as much. Dark, dense, no flare. And when I say no flare, that's not quite true. It will flare. On the other hand, when you get down into this hair right here, it's, it's gonna flare like crazy. That's great for muddler heads, but not worth a darn for tying wings and tails on humpies and wolves. And you'll notice if you look at this very carefully that it's darker further down into the fiber here than it is here. Well, if we are tying big enough flies that we get down into this part of the hair, this is not very good for tails. But most of the time you're tying flies in the 12 to 20 range, and even a, a hair that's got a lot of light in it, if it's got plenty out on the tips that is dark, dense, remember dark, dense, doesn't flare, then you'll have a good hair for, for your wings and tails. I want you to notice the coloring. This is what we call a, the pinstripe shirt on a guy. On the flip side, this is off of a mule deer. I think you can, can readily see that the, it, it's different. And the difference about it we've learned over the years is that you cannot, we don't, feel we get a good consistent coloring on one tail to the next tail on, on the flies that we send out. Okay, enough on that. That's the only, only reason and it's a personal preference. We probably have 
commercial tires out there in, in the world that are using nothing but mule deer and would take exception to what we say, and that's fine. Anyway, what we send out to customers all have white tail in it for the reasons that we stated. Now let's go back to this hide for a minute. Wings and tails. But as you get down into the rib area, this is a spinning hair for muddlers, bass bugs, whatever. And you get down into the belly hair, and some of that is just basically worthless for most of the fly tying purposes. I haven't found a real good use for it. Uh, some of the stuff is okay off of elk, but on the, on the white tailed deer, I haven't found a lot of good use for it. You get down into the way down into the leg, I don't see any on this hide, but you get way down into the leg and there's some really dense hair on the hock. It's called hock hair. Excellent, excellent for wings and tails on small flies because these the hock hair is pretty short. Okay, you have a similar situation with an elk hide. Dark down the middle, great wings and tails, better for spinning, or something that flares a bit like a, the wing on an elk ear caddis. And down here along this area is something that we'll talk about in the future, but it's the drip line. It's when the rain hits the animal. Notice it's dark along here. That's the shingles of the animal. This is the installation for the body. And the hair, the rain runs down and then it hits the belly area and it drips line, it drips off like the edge of a roof. And the hair is shaped very different along here on either a white-tailed deer or on on a um, on elk. It's very different. We'll get to that at another time because that that's another whole complex issue to talk about is the way the drip line hair is shaped because it's an incredible material for tails on small on small dries. You won't even know it's um it's a hair. Sometimes it looks like I have like you're putting on a hackle fiber tail. But in actuality, it's um, it's hair. Now, let's talk about calf tails. This is one that I've been, this is the one I worked on in our last session. And in fact, you can see most of it's gone. And I stopped using on it, even though I got some really good hair here. I'll take that over to the other vice here in just a minute so we can get a closer look. But that's that's some good stuff. It's okay for wings and tails. Notice I said wings and tails. On, on dry flies. It's even better as a long, fairly straight and fairly dense fiber for wings on small streamers. And I'm talking streamers size eight and smaller. This is the, our go-to stuff for uh, hair wing streamers uh, over and above bucktail because this is finer. I'll show you up I'll close here in just a minute, but this is finer uh, than <clears throat> than bucktail, and bucktail can be a little bit coarse sometimes, uh, depending on where you get it off the tail, of course. Now this is, this is a tail that I want you to notice if you look real careful, we'll look at it up close uh, here in just a moment, but it's very full from, it was right here, this is all the stuff that went on the hook today. It's very full until we get about here. There's kind of a middle section in here. This is a primo hair wing stuff. This has a lot of waste in it because there's a lot of extra insulation to keep the animal warm and it's the closest to the body. This down here is for shedding water. And here is the long, nice stuff for streamers. See how long that is? And it's very dense. And you see too that uh, there doesn't seem to be the same amount of fuzz, if you will, as, a, as you have in this. A lot of fuzz down in the base. Almost no fuzz in this, and that's why it's such good for the for the streamer wings. But let's get over to the to the vice. There we go. <clears throat> now here is that um, hair that we were working on today. No, oh, I got a piece of deer hair that fell in there, and I want you to notice that how there's so much fuzz right down in there, and in fact, it even looks fatter. The whole uh, bundle there is a lot fatter and as you get into this part there's less of the under fur see there's a whole lot less under fur than you have right here now you can make this work but you have a lot of under fur to get rid of this there's a whole lot less that you have to get rid of and now this is getting out on the tip this is the really great stuff for streamers 
See how nice and long that is? Almost looks like um, an inexpensive version of polar bear. It doesn't quite have the translucency that polar bear does. But look how nice and long that is. That's your streamer wings. So you use it for different things. It may show up a little bit better in this. This is one that I that I set aside from our tying session the other day. I used all of that in the flies up to the up to the point that we got to today. This I'm just saving for streamers, and we'll be tying streamers at some point down the line. And that's what this will be used for. Now let's talk about good whip finishes and bad. Sorry for hitting the camera there, folks. Get this here. Now I am going to take this. Right here, I think this would work pretty good. Yeah, it's, 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 I think it's wide enough for you to see. And I'm just going to go ahead and wrap this on the hook. <clears throat> now, we're going to pretend that that application right there is the head of a fly. In fact, it'll be a little bit blurry, but I think you'll see it better if I zoom in. You can see now that's um, the head of the fly. And most people, when they tie a fly, when they get done wrapping the hackle and doing everything and they're ready to do their whip finish, they end up at the hook eye. I did it for 40 years, I know. I want you to see what happens though. When you apply the whip finish and you start at the front, making each subsequent turn further back on the hook shank. I'm gonna lay the trap, start the first wrap here, the second wrap further back, third wrap further back yet, and the fourth wrap further back. And now let's just go ahead and pull this up. And I want you to notice what happens. Can you see that that's going to be laying right across those turns? I wonder where the weak spot is. Well, that's that exposed strand of thread laying across the top. And the only reason I didn't have trouble for those 40 years is I glued everything. Well, the glue takes care of it, but if you don't glue, you got a problem. So what you're supposed to do now is you start your whip finish back on the head and wrap each subsequent turn closer to the eye. So let's pretend, pretend now that I know that's kind of gobby looking, but we're gonna start on the back part of the head and go forward. And I want you to see what happens to the whip finish. First turn, second, third, fourth, I want you to notice that all of it disappears under. And that strand, that movable strand, is protected by the four strands that I placed earlier. And there you are. Gretz, you ready to sign off and say, say goodbye for the day? Um, or did you have something you wanted to well, show? I want to, yeah, no. Uh, I, you don't? I don't think so. I had something earlier, but I just finished the fly, so. Okay, well, it isn't like we probably won't do it a thousand more times and get a chance to share it with them all. Yeah, I just want to finish this fly. Okay, well then, do. folks, thank you so much for joining us. We'll be around again one of the, in, a, in the next few days. Uh, tomorrow, Friday, the 20... No, not tomorrow is going to be, let's see, it'll be the 9th, 9th. of December. We have BT's Fly Time Friday. And uh, Dutch Bachman... Uh, a really great tire from Texas will be featured there. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to our Facebook page, which is Gretchen Dash Al, last name Beatty, on Facebook. You type that into the search engine, it'll take you there. And the Zoom link and all of that stuff will be in, on, on that page. Thanks a lot, folks. Thanks for joining us.